Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. Take all of the advice, do all of the things, but but most importantly, do you. Be clear about what that means and do that because, you know, that's where it all comes from. You know, the kind of director that I want to be is not the kind of director that you're going to be. Listeners, actors, filmmakers, thespians, Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend Justin Simeon your ears. Um, We have such an insightful and inspirational and intimate and inspiring interview on In the Envelope today with Justin Simeon, the writer, director, editor, producer, best known for his film and TV series, Dear White People. And this really is an episode for everyone. I'm talking backstage users and non-backstage users, pop culture enthusiasts and not pop culture enthusiasts who are not at all familiar with Justin's work. Whether you are an artist trying to make it in the industry, whether you are an aspiring artist, regardless if you're just a person, I really think this is a terrific interview and actually just full episode because shout out once again to our backstage casting insider, Christine McKenna Torella. Please stay tuned after this lovely interview with Justin for our segment with Christine, because taken together, this is your guide, listener, to creating a personal mission statement, which can be used to navigate, sure, the arts industry. It can be used to create or figure out your own stories you want to tell and storytelling style and uh, you know creative artistic process from inspiration to fruition, all of that, but also just yourself. Christine's segment is awesome. Please stick around for it. I literally listened to it and I literally took out a notepad to take notes. So thank you, Christine, for continuing to really enhance and make concise the best parts of these interviews in a way that's super refreshing for, again, for backstage users trying to make it in the biz, but also for for anyone. This week's episode is for anyone. Justin has this great quote where he talks about how he is not Campbell Soup, and it is one of many great quotes in this interview. I can't wait for you guys to hear it. All of his advice about knowing the market and how that is of a piece with your artistic creative brain is sort of the more producerial, being a producer, thinking about the biz brain. I found it really fascinating to ask Justin about his work in publicity and social media before his breakout hit of Dear White People, because that, as as we keep hearing on this podcast, your day job, whether or not it's in the industry, absolutely contributes to that journey of you yourself as a person, that artistic journey, that inspiration. And he had a really interesting answer as to how that affected things in his in his trajectory. But um, Justin's trajectory is once again a perfect example of anyone who's listening can cherry pick the parts of it that work for them. I'm going to shut up and get to it. And if you want to check out Justin's new film, it's called Bad Hair, and it stars Elle Lorraine. And just to give you guys a sense of who else is in this incredible cast, Lena Waithe, Laverne Cox, Kelly Rowland, and Usher, um, James Vanderbeek, and the one and only Vanessa Williams. It is such a fun film. It is a horror film. I did have to watch it through my fingers because that's how I watch horror films. And um, asking Justin about that was a great way to get inside his creative process and to understand that as well. So anyway, let's take a quick break, get introduced to Justin, and then hear from Christine. Thank you all so much for listening. This podcast is brought to you by Backstage, the world's number one casting platform. Listen, a lot of the guests on In the Envelope, an awards podcast, 
used backstage at the beginning of their careers. It's how they are now in the running for Emmy, for Oscar, for Tony, etc. If you are at the beginning of your career as an artist, here's what you do. You go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope at checkout for a free 30-day trial. That's right, free 30-day trial if you go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code envelope. All you gotta do then is make a profile, upload a headshot, and start applying to jobs, to the thousands of casting notices that are uploaded every day, which you can filter online to match your specific talents, your specific needs, your specific looks. Get that dream started today. Check out that free 30-day trial, backstage.com slash subscribe, enter the code envelope. Let's do it. A film and TV writer, director, editor, and producer with a theater background, Justin Simeon got his industry breakout at the 2014 Sundance Film Festival with his provocative, instant classic satire, Dear White People, which he has since developed into a hit Netflix series now filming its fourth season. His new film, Bad Hair, is a horror comedy with an all-star cast, now streaming on Hulu. Here's our insightful interview with Justin Simeon. Where are you? I'm at Tamarack. Uh, it's the name of the facility where we shoot uh, Dear White People. It has very thin walls. It kind of looks like an insurance building or an uh-huh. insurance office. It's very glamorous, but yeah. um, it's where we shoot. <laughs> and it's under. It's totally underway. Season four is underway. It's underway, yeah. We are almost done with block two, which what that means um, is we're about, we're about at the halfway mark. That's yeah. so cool. I mean, that's so... It's nuts. I can't believe it. I, I, yeah. I really can't. In March, this didn't seem possible, really, to just resume any production, so... No, I, 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 I think none of us was fully sure that we would actually be shooting until the day we were here. I mean, it just, it was unfathomable, <laughs> you know. That's 2020. But yeah. then the COVID protocol start, started happening, and we were like, okay, I guess this is all happening still. <laughs> and so, yeah, you know, it's pretty rigorous, but we're doing it. And it is true. You just can't really make plans in 2020, or you just have to be as flexible as possible. And That's, ain't that the truth. As we were just saying, like, by the time, of course, this episode is released, there will have been a national election. So you and I are recording this before whatever the events of this crazy week are. And, uh, a national, a national what? I haven't heard of this. <laughs> national crisis. Um, what is an election? <laughs> um, yes. We yes. are not gonna. I don't think we're gonna comment further on it, right? Unless it's. I mean, we're backstage, as you know. I'm gonna say it. Biden better be president by the time this comes out, because you know why? I made a joke about Trump being president in my dear white people pitch materials and I feel somehow yes. responsible. So I'm just going to say as many times as I can, Biden will be president. Uh, and you are creating, you're creating a TV show that does, um, obviously you've had to think about the results of this election for, again, something that will come out much later. Mm-hmm. Not really. I mean, the truth is, is that racism, which is primarily, you know, the show is, first of all, the show isn't just about racism. Dear white people is, is, truly about identity versus self. It's a universal issue, Mm. but it's through a black lens. And, you know, because it is through a black lens, we get into identity versus self through, you know, systemic racism. Super fun uh, topic for a comedy. (laughs) Uh, But that's what we do here. And the truth is, is that everything that we're talking about will be uh, very, very solidly a part of the American experience, uh, no matter who the president is. That's so true. Yeah. As yeah. you've proven with those last seasons, that which season was it that came out just before the or just after the after the twenty sixteen election season two? Oh, oh, season one actually. Oh, season one. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We shot uh, the the finale of season one, the the night Trump won, uh, wow. and then you know I was very depressed about it, of course. And then by the time the show was coming out, I was so proud that we had met made something that could. Speak to the moment, but we didn't necessarily plan, you know, on that sense of urgency <laughs> yeah. arising. Sure. And there there was something similar that happened, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, this summer where you you learned that there was an uptick in viewership for dear white people in this yeah, summer that's right. of um, civil unrest and this resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. 
Um, yeah. I mean, are you, so it sounds like you don't feel too too much responsible for like you're not Saturday Night Live. You're not trying to turn around reactions to current events in the news on this topical show. I can't. You know, right. that's not. Um, I don't even know if SNL can really do that, but you sure. know, we all have our <laughs> myths. Um, <laughs> I mean, the truth is, is that uh, similarly to how I felt after Trump was elected, um, you know, after George Floyd's uh, murder and the protests that arose out of that, I was feeling pretty down and pretty useless and just sort of, you know, mm-hmm. having the conundrum that I think any artist who works in the space has, which is mm-hmm. like, is making a TV show, it, is, is that even sort of enough? Like, does that make any kind of dent? And you know, in just sort of burying myself in my work and preparing for this final season, I'd gone back to rewatch the show and found that as I was rewatching it, even though I had made it, even though I had been there um, every step of the way, it was hitting me by surprise how cathartic of an experience mm-hmm. it was because we really did tackle not just sort of the big headliney issues, but we tackle you know, really the subtleties of it, mm-hmm. because we're not, it's not, you know, it's, it's called Dear White People. I, I know people think of it as an issue show, but it's really a character based show. Sure. And um, if we're taking any of these characters seriously, well, then we have to get into, well, what happens when, you know, you are the victim of, uh, of an attack and you become a, a so-called public victim? What happens to your psyche after that? The situation mm-hmm. is over. What happens when people keep asking you, are you okay? What happens when you get all the texts from your white friends? You know, these things that were kind of happening for everyone in the world, uh, when those George Floyd protests started, we had been covering for years in the show in a, in a way that took me by surprise. Mm. And so I felt first a personal sense of just gratification that I had made something that did matter in this moment to me. Um, mm. But then to see that that was happening for other people um, on a pretty dramatic scale with that uptick in viewership was, it was really remarkable. It was it was a time in my life when I I really one of those rare times that you just really feel like, boy, I really am doing the right thing. You know, um, I made something for this moment and I didn't even know that this moment was coming. Right. And that, that sort of mini crisis of faith of, um, am I doing what I should be doing? Is this, is this making a difference? Does that happen often? Are you, do you oscillate back and forth? I have no doubt that I'm supposed to be a filmmaker, storyteller, whatever. Okay. I don't. The part of me that knows I'm supposed to do that doesn't really speak in that language. So I don't know. When I was a kid and I knew I wanted to do this, I didn't know what to call it. Mm-hmm. So I don't have any doubt about that. But is it enough? You know, is it going to matter in the end of the day? Is you know, is it futile? You know, I don't think any of us really those more existential questions. I don't. I don't think any of us have the answer to. So right. you know, I, th- I think I think my job is to try and stay sensitive and to try to keep asking questions. And so. You know, sometimes that leads you to some, some hard, some hard places. I would say, but yeah, but I know this is where I know this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm not mm-hmm. quite always sure why. <laughs> sometimes and the why, yeah, I feel like on good days, answering the question of the why is like a fun journey that you get to go on. Exactly. But when we're stressed <laughs> and overwhelmed, it's more like it's full existential crisis. Yeah. Yeah, it's either full ex- or or you're just so busy it doesn't ever come up. <laughs> you know, oh, that's the other choice. <laughs> and is it safe to say also the hard places, as you say, those provide the inspiration, those provide fuel maybe for storytelling later? They do. It's funny, I was I was just um I was writing a speech, um I'm get, getting an award from this foundation that uh really helps LGBTQIA youth um navigate the educational system. Um Congratulations. And Thank you. And in the speech, you know, one of the things they were talking about is just how difficult it is to be a student at all right now, to go to college when you can't physically go to college and you have COVID and you have all this stuff. And on top of that, you know, you're in a marginalized or several marginalized groups. And the truth is, is that it it is hard. It's not fair. We have to keep fighting against these things. And we shouldn't. I don't think the answer is ever to stifle your own sense of frustration or anger. You can't tell yourself this isn't happening and it goes away. That does not work. (laughs) But at the same time, you know, I, 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 Dear White People is, is entirely based on my frustration of being yeah. a gay black man navigating spaces that were not built for me uh, and, and came out of very painful places. But I would never, you know, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing right. um, if I didn't have something to turn into a meaningful story. Totally. Totally. And it has to come from, it has to come from your own personal experiences. I mean, you mentioned yeah. your, 
your background. We are backstage. First of all, do you know backstage? Did you ever use backstage for casting? Of course. I was, um, so I was a theater kid. Uh, I went to performing arts high school in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, I've been familiar, I've been on (laughs) and sort of, you know, we were all as, as any good performing arts high school will do, we were all told how difficult it is and what we're going to have to do when we move to New York and LA and we want to be actors. I knew at this time I didn't want to be an actor per se, but I was, I still had, you know, all of the indoctrinations and, uh, you know, so I did absolutely use backstage um, when I began casting, you know, my first shorts and and things like that. That's absolutely. Yeah. Um, Because you did start off with shorts. And so it sounded like pretty early on, it was not acting. Did you have like a goal? Did you have a specific classification? I want to be a director or a filmmaker. Yeah, I, I once I realized and this was around nine or ten what a director was, Hmm. that's all I wanted to be. Um, I knew before then I wanted to tell stories with pictures. And I knew I couldn't draw, you know, and I knew that I I was an introvert, but I could also be quite dramatic (laughs) and imaginative. Um, I knew that about myself at that age. Um, And then when I fell into theater, because it was just the only thing, I grew up in Houston, Texas, um, my family didn't understand what a like career in the arts didn't weren't words that went together, okay. you know, in my family. And so um, I saw this flyer one day for this performing arts high school. And I just knew that that's where I was supposed to be. I didn't really understand the difference between theater and film really, truly. I mean, I, I knew the basics, but I didn't know. Oh, cool. And it was really one of the best. It was just the best four years of my life because theater is a wonderful tradition of storytelling, period. And it really helped to refine what kind of artist I would end up being. Um, and it incubated, you know, what would eventually become like all of my processes. And and I okay. got to act a lot and, and perform a lot. And, you know, all of that really, really, I think, has informed the kind of director that I am. That's so cool. I, that's exactly what I would love to hear about. Like, if, if that's what's incubating, I feel like we haven't heard that much um, about the theater side of your background and how that does mm. inform and how that translates to, I mean, there must be a lot of overlap between making theater and directing. Could you specify what that overlap is for you? Yeah, I mean, there's so many overlaps. I mean, at the end of the day, we're telling a story, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with human bodies <laughs> replicating yeah. something like life. The difference is that film really, you know, time is, is what we control in film. Um, okay. You know, you can you can spend four hours shooting a scene that takes one second, <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. As opposed to the theater where things happen in real time, it's really not timing that you have all that much control over. But what's similar about it is that there are a lot of choices to make. There are a lot of artistic choices to make in any given moment in a theater process. Gotcha. Everything from what should the character be wearing to who should they be looking at to what is their motivation for the scene? What should the lighting be? What kind of stage should we have? When should we, you know, I mean, it's endless. Sort of and everyone. you really have to figure out what what your process is in terms of filtering out what the important questions are and and what questions can wait or what questions are best delegated to other people. And that being, being able to do that at a very young age um, gave me a lot of confidence that when I, you know, moved into filmmaking, you know, and you get asked a billion questions every minute uh, that you can't possibly have really thoughtful answers to Mm. and not feeling like I was a failure or I didn't belong because I didn't know something. Right. Theater had taught me that not knowing something has nothing to do with, you know, being able to admit you don't know something is actually a good quality. Right. Um, and and sort of, uh, you know, being a quote unquote leader or directing is a, a communicative process. It's a community based process. It is not an authority. You know, it can be, of course, a dictatorship, yes. but it, yeah. in, in its best in, in its best iteration, it isn't that. Um, right. You know, you, you sort of set parameters and you decide what the priorities for you are. Uh, and you get to set the artistic process. Um, and I got a chance to do that as a kid a lot of times over. And of course, I got the chance to act, mm-hmm. which, um, which, you helps. know, I think makes makes me as, me as a director like, you know, it's like I have a, a secret weapon or something. You know, um, mm-hmm. the actor is, is the special effect always. Cool. What the actor is doing on camera is more important than anything that you're going to do with the CGI. It's more important than the shots. You know, I can have these beautifully composed 
um, sequences and audiences don't even notice. Like they don't even care. Oh, the geometry and the frame is pro- who cares? You know, like that's something that doesn't even get dissected until after it's a hit and probably after you're dead and you're revered and all. <laughs> nobody cares about that, but they can feel the performance and yes. they can feel if it's working or not, or if it's phony or if it moves them, you know, that has to be the focus of the director. And there are lots of directors who who get great performances without necessarily interfacing with the actor. But I think that that's very difficult to do. Yeah. And so it's helpful to be able to get in there, speak the language of an actor, gotcha. um, be able to interpret the scene from an actor's standpoint and understand that the actor isn't like a meat puppet. I mean, sometimes they are. I mean, and I'll say it too on set. I'm like, <laughs> I'm so sorry. I have to do this. I need you to put your hand in the air, yeah. fingers, sp- one finger down, then pull it up. You know, you have to kind of do that sometimes because it can get so technical. But truly, like these are storytellers right alongside the director. You are also helping me tell the story and your choices really, really matter. And they're creative and they're a part of this process, too. And just being able to, like, have the confidence to have a conversation like that with an actor, um, invaluable. Yes. That, as as you can imagine, because we are backstage and we are mostly geared towards the actor's journey, that is pure gold because... I think actors really want to hear from their directors, from their collaborators, that they are a valued, valued collaborator. I also just love this idea that like humility seems to be the quality that maybe it comes from, especially theater of, Mm. I don't know all the answers. This is a group effort. I am not a dictator. I am not in charge of everything. it's a it's a balance between humility and arrogance. I mean, you have to be a little arrogant okay. to even think that any of this is possible. I mean, wow. it's so crazy okay. what we do. I mean, it really is. I mean, you have to walk into a room with a hundred people who you may or may not know who are all looking at you for they don't just want an answer. They need like direction. <laughs> they need yeah. to know what color are the socks. They need to know what time of day you want to shoot this. What, how do you envision the wallpaper? And yeah. you have to stand before these people and speak, you know, with confidence uh, about something. You know, you can't make it up. I mean, you can. Lots of people do. Uh, you, you can't hide. I mean, some people do. But, you know, it, you got to you have to have you, you have to know when to be what I would say wow. <laughs> fluctuate or determine the level of humility to uh, I love the idea of arrogance and maybe the, the happy you go between a, is confidence you need a little bit of arrogance I mean yeah. you know <laughs> how can big. you direct a group of people dream big yeah. um, you know I think um, I think actors are familiar with this too it's like you have to be audacious in order to get the part but then once you get the part you have to know where you fit within the ensemble you have to be able to do both yeah there's a humility with that too so it sounds like having yeah. acted acting you yourself acting definitely informs you yourself as a writer and as a director absolutely mm-hmm. in fact i'd love to hear about the writing part too i'm always fascinated by you know writing processes do you have is that something? Is that also something that you develop a style or a process? I mean, I think my style and process was probably more informed by film school. But the further and further I get out of film school, the more it just reverts back to something a little more primal. Yeah. And at the end of the day, for me, writing is it's improv, but it's just in my head. And my job is to sort of dictate it and um, dictate it, but also like give it parameters so it doesn't seem random. I mean, it's literally, that's what improv is. You, you give a scene parameters. You're this kind of person, you're that kind of person. Yes. And et cetera, mm-hmm. whatever the rules of the thing you're doing. And it's, that's what's happening, but it's like all in my head between my various crazy personalities. And then my job is to sort of dictate that. And then yeah. later see if that works or if it reads or if something feels fake or You know, the other big part of my process is realizing that all the voices in my head don't necessarily cover the full gamut of the human experience, which I think, you know, white men are learning some for the first time, straight white men are learning some for the first time right now. But Mm. I think that any artist should have that ability to go, you know what, maybe I need to research, maybe I need to do interviews. Um, Mm. With Dear White People, I've gotten so spoiled with having a room of writers who, you know, really have the lived experiences of my characters so that those gotcha. characters aren't just avatars for me, mm-hmm. which is the case for any writer. 
Um, but that they also have the lived experience of, of actual, you know, women or straight men or white men or whoever, whatever, you know, that character is, hmm. you know, they have a representative in that room. So even when I'm writing like a feature or something, I'm, I tend to do that in a kind of community. I like to have a lot of workshops. I like right. to bring actors in to read the scripts out loud mm-hmm. uh, with me and for me. Um, and I like to ask a lot of questions and see if I'm getting it right. Mm-hmm. And that's that that community of people who's helping you. Is it all? Is it always people you know, or are you trying to grow a network of like I would like to reach outside my comfort zone and work with collaborators I've never worked with before, or I have very mm-hmm. little in common with? or could learn from? I think in the workshop process, I'm pretty protective, you know, so it tends to be people I know, or if there's someone I don't know, it's, they've been brought in through someone that I know, you Mm -hmm. know, both because I don't want to share the work yet. It's not ready to be shared. It's real. we really are are workshopping. And I also, you know, I I need the kind of, you should always question the source when getting feedback. I need the kind of people who understand the kind of feedback that I need and who are qualified to give it. And, um, you know, and also actors who understand like, hey, I'm not, this is not me getting the role. This is not even an audition. This is a yeah. workshop process. And, you know, so that tends to be pretty tight to the chest. Now, when I'm, when I'm in a hiring place and I'm, you know, I tend to, I tend to bring on the people that I, I really enjoyed working with before or who I think are especially skilled for what I have to do next. But, you know, I've only made two feature films of, of I'm in my fourth season of television. Right. So, you know, oftentimes I, I, I'm at a new project and I don't have anybody. And so that's the part where like, okay, I'm open to someone I've never met or someone who's gotcha. really going to challenge my point of view um, on something, you know, cause I think that can be really rewarding too. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's kind of a toss up. I, I want people that I'm comfortable with. I certainly am not uncomfortable with the the clash in the creative process, but I, I'm not interested in someone who is trying to, you know, live out all of their lives battles and demons with me over, you know, <laughs> creative choices. <laughs> like, gotcha. I, I don't need that. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, there, there's a there's a line where you're judging up demons or like even just being antagonistic for the sake of, I don't know. Yes. It's and it's, it's also, product, then. and it's also tricky. And that's why I think it's helpful to be an actor. Cause I know how ridiculous the ask is. I'm asking you to come in here and pretend like none of this is happening and give me real authentic, unbridled emotional responses, totally <laughs> completely in the present moment, yes. uh, with no safety net, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, literally a camera in your face and small and smoke and smells and the COVID mask, you know, it's oh. a lot. It's a yes. lot. What, what we're doing is crazy. Um, totally. You know, so I, I, it's good to just have some respect for that, you know. Yes. As you say, even just the simple, the fact that there's a camera in your face, that alone is so much of a <laughs> it's actress. It's insane. Our magicians, yeah. Doing it at home in front of a mirror is hard enough, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Now there's people and there's yelling and there's an earpiece. I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. And ultimately, all I'm trying to get you to do is to feel comfortable enough for the moments that we're in the scene to be fully present to the material in the scene and to react to it as you would, Hmm. you know, in your life as if none of us was here. It's an incredibly hard thing to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. so that's that's this is actually beautiful because that was like the writing process. And you've just spoken about more like the directing hat. Do you think of them as Mm. hats that you're taking on and off? I've stopped. I've stopped thinking about it as much like that. I mean, you kind of have to. That's the way the industry works. I have to say, over quarantine, when I suddenly had time hmm. and and pace to do things a little bit more slowly, I really remembered how much I loved editing and remembered how much I loved drawing, even though I'm not very good at it. And realized, like you know, this segmenting of because I'm a filmmaker, and some people are directors, some people are writers. I, I keep calling myself a storyteller because I'm kind of both. You know, sure. Um, I don't have to direct things that I write, mm-hmm. uh, and I don't necessarily even have to direct, you know, write things that. Uh, wait, I don't have to direct things that I write. I also don't have to, you know, I can write things for other people to direct as well. It's mm-hmm. not like that, but I, it is a holistic process in my head. Yes, and so I, I start planning the scenes and thinking about the performances while I'm writing them, and and I'm still writing them when I'm in the scene directing the performances. It's all wow. kind of a, the same process to me. Uh huh. You know, and is that um, that same process, that sort of holistic approach? Where does producing fit into that? Is producing sort of that? It's all of that combined stuff. 
producing is for me facilitating a process. Okay. So it's, you know, it's everything from deciding who should be the people in the room, who are de- who are department heads, making really logistical kind of decisions, um, making budgetary decisions. What is more valuable in this production? What can we do without, hmm. you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, producing is a very wide, it, it can mean a lot. There are many, many different kinds of producers and ways to produce. But when, you know, when I claim the title for something I've done, it's usually because, you know, I've had to facilitate, I've had to do something outside of the creative process itself to facilitate the work, okay. um, to establish what the work is going to be and how it's going to function. Outside the creative process. That's actually, that totally yeah, opens it's, my it's, eyes it's, to it's, it's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's like everything you got to do. And there's some creativity there, you yeah. know, picking this casting director over that one or whatever. There is creativity there, but by and large, it is outside of the actual process itself. Yeah. It's logistics. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot and, of unwieldy, unwieldy logistics. <laughs> unwieldy, sure. And so many challenges. And like, as you say, in terms of your background of, of theater and community, this idea of what are my priorities? What can I delegate? What comes first? Yes. That's yes. all producing as well. Yeah. I would say so. It's also a lot of directing too, sure. you know. Um, but but look, it's 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 again, it's something I got to learn very early. You know, you may not know whether or not you want the wall mm-hmm. to be blue, or if you want her to cry in the scene, or what she should be wearing. But you can know what story you want to tell, and uh, we can all make choices based mm-hmm. on on those intentions. Awesome. Um, well, the other question I had, uh, I guess this is more of a quick side note, but. You also worked in publicity and even in yes, social media, yes. kind of on the filmmaking side of things. Is it safe to say that was like as you were as you were writing your screenplays and trying to be creative, you were getting into the industry with more of these like I guess day jobs? At first, it was very frustrating. Ah. Um, you know, I, I wanted to just get right into it. You know, I was twenty two or twenty three and just li- literally thought. Oh, I'm going to put my my stu- my senior thesis into film festivals, and within six months, you know, mm. I'll be a director. I mean, really, I was that <laughs> naive. Um, eight years later, you know, I was finally able to to make Dear White People, and so there was a lot of frustration there. Um, but I was also really good at PR, and okay. I realized that I, I was attracted to because there is a storytelling element to PR because you're basically telling at least with film uh-huh. publicity. You're telling a story about the story. You know, the the actual story itself is is too complicated to explain to a potential audience before they see it. But so you have to come up with a story about the story or a story that like runs alongside the story. And that story could be as simple as like, you're going to have a lot of fun watching this. Or that story (laughs) could be, you know, much more complicated. But I got really honed in on the Mm. difference between those two things. And so uh, to be honest with you, even though some of it felt like a struggle for me at the time. I'm so grateful to it because I I wouldn't have, I literally couldn't have made a break in this industry if I hadn't learned how to do that. You know, Dear White People started with a concept trailer on YouTube that I just made with tax return money. I I wouldn't have thought to do that. I wouldn't have thought to make the trailer the way I made it. I wouldn't have thought to highlight the scenes that I did. You know, all of my priorities and choices with regards to making that concept trailer came from you know, being a part of these amazing PR and marketing teams uh, mm-hmm. and, and taking movies that, you know, some of them came in with really big ambitions. Some of them, you know, were just dumped on us. No one thought they were going to make any money. And, and, and I saw how that really had nothing to do with whether or not they were successful or whether mm-hmm. or not they connected with their audiences. You know, we made terrible movies work and we saw wonderful movies not work. <laughs> and, and really the difference was how good is the story about the story? We're oh my gosh! And so that is so you know, fascinating to me. Yeah. 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 Because that sounds like it's it's and you didn't know maybe you didn't know this at the time, but it's scratching your creative process itch of figuring out how to tell stories. Absolutely, it absolutely was, and it's still something I, you know, now that it's it's for my own things, it's, it's something I'm very involved in. You know, my, I think all of my films and, and my TV show, you know, they've they've all had a pretty innovative and interesting marketing um, PR yeah. component. And mm. part of that is because it, it, you know, it means a lot to me to be involved in that process. And especially as a person who is, you know, a queer black filmmaker, I, I'm not making 
things that people are used to. You know, I'm not making Campbell's soup. I'm just not. I, I can't. I don't want to. And so, you know, I have to lay down some track before I put things out. I have to I have to explain to some people, even my target audience, what it is that I'm trying to do before they just see it. Because, wow. um, you know, they may not be accustomed to that or used to that coming out in this form. You know, dear white people and bad hair, I'm constantly putting things together in scenes that you aren't supposed to. <laughs> black people <laughs> in classical music, you know, black right. people in, in smart, articulate dialogue. Gay people and straight black people, you know, it, it's just endless. It's, it's, the, it's the part that gets me excited to be a storyteller, to be honest. So I was able to That's recognize, something. you know, one, one of the first things I ever worked on was Brokeback Mountain. And I just remember, like, mm-hmm. we all knew that that was an important movie, but there was no reason really to think that we were going to really break it out the way it did. And, gotcha. um, you know, so I just saw firsthand how important that part of it is. That is so interesting to me. It really sounds like advice to actors. Like, not only is it great to get a day job in the industry, because of course, then you're, is it also safe to say you were making connections and understanding kind of the the mechanics, the cogs of the biz, right? Yeah, absolutely. But I would also say that anything you do is, it can feed you. You know, I had my acting right. teacher always said, use it. Mm-hmm. You know, if you come into an audition and you're really fucking nervous, well, use that. Make your nervousness what the scene's about, you know. And so if you're working at, you know, a car insurance, I'm saying that because that's what my office looks like. If you're working, <laughs> you know, uh, if you're doing car insurance and you're like, this has nothing to do with my job. I bet you there's a there's just life stuff. I mean, because what, yeah. what we do, all we do is we are conjuring up people's lives for them so that they can feel and experience things in our stories or in our performances that they can't feel in everyday life. Mm. And so we have to get really good at knowing what life is, what it feels like. And you can do that in any position, doing anything. That's sort of the kumbaya, be present in the moment answer that all of us hate to hear, but it's just really true. No, absolutely. And it's that skill of like being able to explain what your movie is and why it might be interesting to an audience that absolutely helps you as maybe particularly as the um, outside of the creative process, as a, as more of the producer side of things, right? It, it does because, you know, I, um, you know, I, I, there, there is an artistry there. And, and, it's, and yeah. I'd be lying if I said that it wasn't something I think about when I'm sitting down to write a script for the first time or hmm. to put an idea together. Like I, I'm looking at both what the story is going to be, but also what story about the story are we going to tell when it's time to release it when it's time to cast it, you know, when it's time to announce it, that all of that plays into, into it for me. See, that's so, that's so awesome to hear. I think our listeners, especially those just getting into the industry, I feel like on this podcast, we've even talked before about the idea that you got to get good at the business side of things. You got to be good at networking and being able to sell yourself. And then there's the artistic creative side of things, but you're saying the artistic, there's art artistry and creativity to be found in figuring out how to sell your products and sell yourself. Absolutely. I I don't think you, I mean, look, you can do it however you want to do it. For me, Uh segmenting myself into all these different people doesn't, you know, help that much because I'm already a bunch of different people. You know, I mean, that's the (laughs) truth about how psychology and trauma just work. If you're an actor, you already know you got trauma. But especially if you're a person of color or you're marginalized or you're a woman or you're dealing with something on top of just being a human being that for whatever reason wants to create, you're already segmented. And the goal of your life is going to be to integrate and be a whole person. So instead of going to a room as half of yourself or a third mm. of yourself or an eighth of yourself, go into every room as yourself and do the things that you want to do because you are clear on why you're doing them and what it's all for. You know, like I, I, rem- I never would go to networking events. I, I never mm-hmm. did. I hated them. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't. Un- and, and I didn't understand for me personally why I had to go because I, if I didn't have a project that was ready, you know. And people would harangue me all the time about it. And I would end up going and I would feel really guilty when I didn't go and all this stuff. And I could have saved myself a lot of guilt and a lot of time because guess what? It never mattered for me. I'm not saying networking doesn't matter for anybody, Mm. but it didn't matter for me. I Mm. I needed to network when I was ready to share a script or talk about a specific project. And so, you know, yes, take all of the advice, do all of the things, but, but most importantly, do you be clear about what that means. 
and do that because, you know, that's where it all comes from. You know, the kind of director that I want to be is not the kind of director that you're going to be. Yeah. We're everyone is different. And, and even as a performer, as an actor, your path in life is just going to be remarkably different than everyone else's. You know, when you buy clothes, you know, uh, what, 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 I don't ever do this, of course, because I'm just not this fashionable. But what they always tell you is you go <laughs> buy a clothes, you buy cheap clothes, and then you get them tailored. You know, so take all sure. the advice, but make sure to take that time to tailor it to yourself. <laughs> that is beautiful. That's beautiful advice. Well, and just going off of that, you mentioned this idea of like, because we are backstage, I, I would love to hear more early career artist advice, maybe particularly for storytellers who are from marginalized groups, storytellers yeah. of color? I think that, I think my advice there is to, you should be thinking about the marketplace. Mm -hmm. You have to. You have to think about what people are going to buy, what do they want, etc. But you can't let that dictate your process. They are okay. separate processes. This is very, very, very important. Because if all you're allowing yourself to do and think about creatively are the things that you think are going to get you where you want to go. Right. Well, then you're going to, by the time you get to where you're going, you will have completely lost all joy in the creative process. And I'm speaking from experience, you know, and okay. I'm, I'm speaking from experience and I'm echoing a thing that I, everyone I know of who has, you know, so-called made it, had their big break, has experienced that like, mm. yes, I'm doing all these wonderful things that I've wanted to do my whole life, but I don't even remember why this is fun. Well, that's because like you've completely shut off the part of yourself that just wants to create because it's fun and right. because it's play and because it's it's satisfying to your soul. And that's the part of you that becomes more and more valuable as you so-called make your break. And so mm -hmm. never don't ever get rid of that part of you that just wants to put on a show for two people or just wants to do it because it's fun or just mm -hmm. wants to play dress up or just wants to be a kid like don't ignore that part of you. Don't say, no, that's not going to sell. No, that's not going to give me this right. job. No, I have to do this. You know, you got to balance out those two voices because I'm telling you, you know, you, you're going to, you need, you need the voice that's thinking about the outs, outside world to make it for sure, to break mm -hmm. in. But once you're in, you got to remember who you are. You got to remember what, what your individual spirit is saying all that woo-woo stuff really matters <laughs> on the other side because then when you're in front of a room of people who are waiting for you to give them a creative direction, mm. well, you have access to your creative instincts because yeah. they're it's not about making it at that point. At that point, it is discovering like, well, should the wall be blue, damn it? Should she be crying <laughs> in this scene? And who is going to tell you that information if not for that inner part of you that, you know, just likes doing it because it's super fun. Totally. It doesn't care that we've been working for 15 hours. <laughs> you exactly. Know? Well, you need you her. Say, you need him. Absolutely. As you say, you speak from experience. There, there must have been times, there are times in your career where you can't hear that voice, right? Where you kind of lose touch with the yourself part of yourself Absolutely. during the process. I lose touch yeah. with it or or that part of me becomes very angry and upset and feels mm. very hassled because he only gets to come out and play. Now I'm talking about my inner child. He only gets to come out sure. and play when, you know, uh, there's a due date or when I need something by five or when I, you know, it, that's not uh, fair either. No. Uh, he's got, I need time to, we're in California, smoke mm -hmm. weed, watch old movies and write <laughs> shit and edit <laughs> It just cause, just yes. cause it's so fun. And what we do is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And it's, we create dreams for other people. That's literally what we do. That's so fun. We can't lose that part of it. Totally. Um, just because, you know, of the psychotic nature of this industry. And it's very mm -hmm. psychotic and it's very nuts. And you have to be sharp and you have to think about your career and how you're going to get to the places you want to go. But you have mm -hmm. to give room for this part of you that doesn't operate that way too. Mm. Right. The industry is sometimes at odds with your inner child coming out to play with kind of, I love this idea of like, it's specifically unstructured uh, time yes. of enjoyment and, and just fun and play. Yes, absolutely. If you, you know, once you're on that set and it's hot and we got one hour <laughs> to shoot this scene and you are going to actually have to cry and the room is blue, but blue makes you sick. I'm, I'm still going back to the same analogies here. And, you know, <laughs> it's, it, everybody's there and they're wearing COVID masks and it's extremely awkward. If you can't, if you can't access that part of you, then 
you're screwed and you know it. <laughs> and guess what? She's not going to be there for you if you haven't been there for her or him, you know, right. throughout the process. And, and then I've been there before. Head. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's yeah. tricky. It's real it tricky, tricky to get out of that pot, that spot. Exactly. And and kind of refilling the tank, as you say, this idea of like editing shit and writing shit. And I'd love to hear about your influences. What are these old movies you're watching? And like, what are <laughs> what are like your most formative pop culture references? Well, I mean, you know, they vary. I think that I think Kubrick was my first sort of that's the first time I like fell in love and understood cool. like that a director had a signature style. I was, you know, in high school at the time, but. Um, I just remember like watching Eyes Wide Shut and absolutely hating it for like the first 45 minutes. It was unlike any movie I'd seen. <laughs> Why is it so long? What are these Zoom shots? I just didn't get it. And then by the end of that movie, I was on the edge of my seat. And I, <laughs> I couldn't, like I couldn't stop watching it. And I was like, okay, he did that to me on purpose. How did he do that to me? And I became obsessed oh. with Kubrick. Um, and because Kubrick was such a cinemaphile, I be, you know, I started to follow his trail to uh, the French New Wave directors and to the Italian directors, um, you know, to Truff- Truffaut and Bergman and all that. And then, I, and then I discovered Do the Right Thing at a certain point in college and realized okay. that all that cool cinematic artful stuff that I was falling into, I could do that and tell stories about people who look like me. Mm-hmm. And that really was like the connective Point and the connective tissue, I think, as a young as a young person, uh, in terms of what kind of things I wanted to do, I, I wanted to make stuff that was artful and mm-hmm. that was provocative and that was challenging and that you had to lean into. But I also wanted to make a connection with the audience. You know, I, mm-hmm. I didn't want to just sort of, you know, you know, I love Brechtian material, but even Brecht can be too Brecht for me. And, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I and, and I was able to kind of find all of that out in high school. And so now, you know, now I, I really do watch. I, I particularly love watching old movies that I don't know anything about mm. um, because I, I find that I can sometimes get into a silo and just sort of be watching the same filmmakers over and over again. Mm-hmm. But there's so much more out there. And just over this quarantine, speaking of, you know, the George Floyd protests, all of these streamers are putting their black content forward. Hmm. And I'm discovering black filmmakers that no one ever told me about that I hmm. never heard about in film school that were working in the late 80s and the 90s that just literally were never advertised to me, never came up in discussion, et cetera. So just making sure that, like, I understand the tradition of black cinema that I'm walking into has cool. become really, really satisfying, you know. Hmm. So sometimes I'll just be like, what's a black director or what's a black film, or what's a film made by a black director or a black writer that I just haven't seen before? I don't care what the subject is. I don't care when it was made. I don't care what it's about. Let me just wa- let me just take some time and watch it and see what happens. And think, um, yeah, and that's going in very blind. Rewarding. Yeah, going in going blind. Going in is blind. Part of that. Yeah, that's part of it. And then the other side of it is watching things without any any sense of work in mind, which is why I watch a ton of trash television. I watch <laughs> a lot of bad reality and I watch a lot sure. of good reality because, you know, that's the only way I can really watch a story and not be thinking about how it's made. <laughs> okay. It's kind of turn that and part I still, of your brain off. Yeah. And I still, I still often am thinking about how even that is made, but, you know, it helps. <laughs> yes. That's exactly what... Um, I'm going to drop a big name here, but Laverne Cox came on this podcast. I know you know oh, her. Oh, Laverne, I love her. <laughs> and she started on, on, in our podcast interview, she started like analyzing NeNe Leakes and like breaking down <laughs> the psychology oh, of yeah. NeNe Leakes. And I was like, this says so much about your creative process. This is great. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm the same way. I don't, there's not a, you know, trash or, or good or quality or whatever. To yeah. me, it's all the same thing. We're, we're all trying to do the same thing. We're trying to lower, you know, your, you as the audience, your resistance to what you're seeing <laughs> to slip under your skin as if it were your life so that you can dream it, you know, so that you can make that dream that we made your dream. That's what oh. we're all trying to do. We're just trying to do it for different reasons and, mm. um, you know, at diff- for different sized screens and for different amounts of time, perhaps. But that's <laughs> all we're trying to do. Of, yeah, that's your credo right there. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, and so going off of that, going off of everything you just said, because bad hair, I think, is a great example of of there are obvious references. There must have been specific films, filmmaking styles, especially I'm thinking of Hitchcock, that must have referenced your making of this film. Could you walk us through the initial inspiration, the the creative process? Like, how did this come to be? 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, it really began with uh, a movie called The Wig. Uh, my producer, Julie, discovered this film. Uh, it's a Japanese horror film about a possessed weave, or wig, actually. <laughs> there is another film called X Day about a possessed weave. And I sort of, I rabbit holed into these these Asian horror films uh, where mm-hmm. hair is often a, a motif of horror, whether or not it's the center of it. I mean, you can even feel this in something like The Grudge. Um, mm. And then I, I kind of went looking for its equivalent in the States and I didn't see one. And it was just one of those crazy ideas of like, well, why don't I take it? It would be kind of fun to take this like B movie premise of a, of mm. a possessed, you know, weave or something and make like a serious movie out of it that mm-hmm. was funny and entertaining and all those things and campy. But at the end of the day, it had some teeth. It was about something. And yes. it sort of dawned on me that even though I grew up watching horror movies, you know, I loved all the Nightmare on Elm Street as a child, which is really messed up, but whatever, we're here now. <laughs> uh, and, you know, at once I got really into cinema, of course, Hitchcock, uh, you know, De Palma, um, you know, Polanski, you know, all those all those filmmakers. Uh, I love those movies because they I didn't even register them as horror movies because, um, you know, they really are these social commentaries mm. sort of in a B movie horror package. Mm-hmm. Um and I realized, like, I've never thought about making one of those, and that's crazy. And then I got mad about that. Like, why haven't I thought about making one of those? Did I, did I think I couldn't do it? And then, and then at that point, it had me. And it uh, had I had you. to, fo- it had me. The story had me, and I just had to follow it through, <laughs> figure out what I was saying, what it was about. And then my, the other part of it is, you know, because um, you're asking about references. Mm-hmm. I really, with Dear White People, the film, there were a lot of visual quotes. Like I am quoting Fritz mm. Lang in some instances, or I'm quoting, you know, visually quoting Bergman uh, mm. or something like that. And I, I, I actually really wanted to avoid doing that with bad hair. Mm. And so what happens for me is that I watch a lot of things and I watch them again and again and I try to analyze them and then I, let, I try to let them just sort of get into my subconscious so that, you know, I might be referencing stuff, you know, but it's not really like, let me... I don't want to, I'm not that interested in like replicating a shot that Got someone it. else did. You yeah. know, for dear white for dear white people, that was interesting to me because I wanted to make a statement about how we see black faces. I wanted to put black and brown faces in frames that felt naggingly familiar or felt, you know, ingeniously beautiful for a reason we couldn't quite put our finger on. Um, but these are mm. frames and images that, you know, are out there in the in the in the, you know, conscious and the, and the collective consciousness, but with white faces in them. And, mm-hmm. and so for Dear White People, it was, it was part of the strategy to visually quote uh, older movies with, with bad hair. I wanted it to feel like it belonged in 1989 or in a, you know, a category of films, but I didn't really want to replicate any of them um, in particular or be like, oh, that's the shot from Rosemary. I didn't want to do that. Um, right. But that said, the movies that... Uh, Rosemary's Baby was a big one. Body Snatchers, the 1978 version with Donald Sutherland was a big uh, influence. Stepford mm. Wives. Mm. Everything Brian De Palma did from Carrie through Dress to Kill, probably Body Double. Um, everything Hitchcock <laughs> did, period, but certainly after Psycho. Um, mm. You know, and then and then I, I you know, kind of late in my process, I, I found films from Charles Burnett that I'd never seen before called To Sleep With Anger which takes place in a similar time period about a black family digesting, you know, ancient voodoo cultures and modern Mm. Christianity. Uh, Ganja and Hess is a film I discovered during this period. You know, so it was kind of all over the place. Um, But, uh, but, you know, these really intense auteur directors that were just sort of, you know, pouring their obsessions into these female driven psychological thrillers. I watched anything like that that I could get my hands on. Uh, And from that place, I just tried to make creative decisions that felt right for the material or right to what I was, you know, trying to say with the scene or something like that. So all of those influences, like, I love this idea of it gets into your subconscious. And then is it sort of a process of like letting them go? Yeah, they don't. It um, is consciously inform specific aspects of the film. Yeah. I mean, there's some things like, you know, we shot it on film. We shot it on Super 16. Mm -hmm. Um, I I wanted the hair. I knew that we would eventually have to accentuate it digitally, but I wanted 
every hair effect to have to be shot in camera to the best of our ability um, with the you know the technology. I wanted to embrace the limits of 1989 filmmaking. Oh, cool! Um, in you know in shooting the movie itself, so I had these like little you know parameters on it. You know, I knew that I I, I love a zoom lens. I love a zoom lens. I can't <laughs> like I, it's just like one of the first things I think about. Um, and so that plus shooting on film plus sort of setting those parameters. You know, I think it recalls those movies because those are how those movies, you know, had to be shot. They were also shot on film, especially yeah. like some of the early, you know, some of that Wes Craven stuff. Uh, really, that that really gritty early films, uh, you know, from filmmakers in the late seventies, early eighties. That stuff is shot on Super Sixteen, so it has those vibes. But mm-hmm. I, I actually would be kind of hard pressed to point out any scene that was like directly, you know, sort of derived from another scene. Um, yeah. you, you kind of feel a mix of all sorts of stuff going on. There's a little bit of Little Shop in there. There's a little bit of like <laughs> Halloween 3, Season of the Witch in there. There's a little bit of, you know, um, Stafford Wives. There's Camp in it. There's there's a lot of influences, but it, it wasn't like a logic. I didn't like put it through like a logic strainer or anything. Right. And and it's it speaks again to your process that you set it in that time period for it's an early nineties or is it eighty nine? It's set in uh, nineteen eighty nine. Yep. Yeah, and it's also female driven for a reason, right? Well, yeah. I mean, the genre tends to be female driven. Okay. You know, I wonder. I sometimes wonder if psychological thrillers really were how straight men access their inner feminine because Ooh. you know all these movies starting with Psycho. I mean, it's it's like obsessively about women, fr- seemingly fragile women. You know, sort of dealing with a very difficult world. I mean, that's what they're all about. Um, but also because the story of hair, black hair in America. Yes. I mean, it, it is a multi gender story. But I mean, to me, like, it has to be about a black woman. I mean, black yeah. women are, in my opinion, responsible for so many facets of American culture, period, yeah. full stop. And yet their lives and their bodies are just never respected. And as a gay man, you know, I kind of I live in both worlds because, you know, I'm able to be my, I've, you know, growing up, I've been able to be myself around black women in a different way than I've been able mm-hmm. to be myself around any other category of person. And I think that that is true for black women and gay black men as well. Mm-hmm. So there's a symbiosis there. But yeah. um, at the same time, you know, it's not fully my story. So I knew it had to be about a black woman's experience. And I knew that I had to beg Every black woman I knew um, <laughs> whose opinion I trusted to be a part of that workshop process. Mm. Um, and, and to ask formally, you know, you can't really, there's no group meeting that I'm aware of where you ask all members of one group of people, but I, to really ask permission to tell the story too, and to make mm-hmm. sure that, you know, I wasn't just sort of camping over their experience, but was speaking something about their Wonderful. experience. Wonderful. Which speaks again to that just super collaborative. You want authentic voices that are not your own collaborating yes. with you on a piece. Yeah. A- absolutely. I mean, black people invented jazz in this country. And mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's something I draw a lot of inspiration from. And what is jazz? Jazz is a way of navigating America, which means mm. taking all these very disparate voices, instruments, solo styles, et cetera, and making it all work in a cohesive thing. You know, mm. even if that thing seems chaotic, it's a cohesive song. And so I, I, I really, I, I actively and consciously draw inspiration from that. Like mm. that's, I want, I want that to be my process as much as I can translate that into, you know, writing and directing. Wonderful. Wonderful. Oh my gosh. Amazing. Well, I have to let you go soon, but um, can I ask you about how casting and you mentioned workshops or auditions? I mean, do you have a philosophy about casting? What should an actor auditioning for you know? Well, I think there's one thing. The one thing is that some roles are for some people, period. And it doesn't matter how good you are, how pretty you are, what you look like, where you're from. It may just not be your role. And in film, you know, it's not like theater where these are archetypal characters. That, and the part of the fun is seeing who's going to step into that. In film, it's like, you know, it really is about executing a very specific vision. And sometimes somebody walks into that room and you just know. And it's you, it, it, it doesn't come down to who prepared more or who's prettier, who has the better agent. It just doesn't come down to those things. That said, um, 
when I'm always looking for in a collaborator, because sometimes I'll read somebody for a role and that role isn't their role, but maybe I write something for them later, or maybe I think of a different character that was supposed to be a guy and re, you know, like I, I, mm-hmm. I find a lot of value in the casting process. It's not a straightforward process to me. Um, and okay. what I always look for is I want what I wrote. You know, I want, I want to know that you, you get the story that I'm trying to tell mm-hmm. on this page and that you can embody that character and bring it to life. But I also want something else. I want something that I can't anticipate. I want you to bring some of yourself to it so that it's, mm-hmm. you make it, it's a collaboration between my vision and your vision, which to me is exciting. I think my favorite moments in movies are moments when you're like, how did they, they feel spontaneous, they feel so lifelike, they feel almost by accident that you marvel at like, how did they even do that in the scene? And so you got it, for me, I'm looking for a little bit of a surprise. You know, I I wanna know that I can direct you as well. I wanna know that we can have a conversation about the piece. And I wanna know that as a storyteller, you're invested in the story. Um, alongside of just getting the part. And so, uh, you know, those are really, those are the things that I look for. That's awesome. Um, and we yeah. ask this of everyone and it's it's related. Do you have a performance, like what is one performance you think every actor or maybe every filmmaker, every storyteller should see? Is there one that hmm. comes to mind? Wow, there isn't. I mean, there's so many great performances. Gosh, that's a really hard one. That's like asking me like what my absolute favorite movie is. Although I do have an answer for that, but only because people kept asking it. Um, <laughs> gosh. What's your all-time oh. favorite movie then? <laughs> my all-time favorite movie is 2001 A Space Odyssey, which I would not oh. necessarily point to for acting performances. I mean, Stanley yeah. Kubrick didn't really give them a ton to do. <laughs> no, they're, they're wonderful yeah, in yeah. the film, but it's about the concept, you know. He's the star um, of the movie, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He is. He is. Um, Gosh, there's so many great films I could mention. I don't know. I don't know. That kind of (laughs) flatlined my brain. Can I say, can I, can I plug something though? Yes, please. Oh, yes, please. Well, I want to plug my podcast, Don't At Me, um, because on Don't At, Don't At Me with Justin Simeon, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's one of the things I really enjoy doing. It's, I'm an introvert, so it's like the only time I really get to sit and talk with people um, about their process. Yes. Uh, and I talk with a great you know, number of actors, um, mm-hmm. writers and directors. They tend to be emerging or part of some marginal community or something like that. And there's some big names in there. But you know, we really try to get deep and not do the sort of like you know, press interview and get into process and get into life and like, how do you yes. balance all this shit and... Um, you know, so if you enjoy this, come on over there. There's there's a lot more. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, okay, Justin, thank you so much. This was like, you, you just gave like above and beyond textbook, filmmaking process, everything advice. Um, thank you so much. Do you have any... My pleasure. Do you have any parting words of wisdom for uh, backstage users and listeners of this podcast? You got to hustle. You got to do all those things. But that's not the only thing. It's just not the only... That shouldn't be the only person guiding your shit is the part of you that knows... Mm-hmm. You know, I got to look like this and I got to be there and I got to know that guy. You know, you, the part of you that just wants to do it because it's it's fun and it's silly and it, it, it lights you up inside. You can't ever let go of that part of you. That's the most important part. Mm. That beautiful. part of you needs protection and guidance. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, otherwise you, you're not going to survive in the indus- in this crazy industry without that. Listen, you may survive. You may even thrive, but you won't <laughs> enjoy it. You okay. will not enjoy it. Promise you that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I know a lot of people who are doing quite well who are not happy people. Oh no. I don't wanna, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't I don't want to be that person. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Wow, yeah. this is great. It really is like you gave career advice and life advice because you really you gotta keep finding the joy for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And this was a pleasure and, and great questions. Thank you so much, Jack. Thank you, Justin. Oh gosh, thank you so much. And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. This week I wanted to build on some of the ideas that I've been discussing with you guys recently. During the Julie Taymor interview, I was encouraging you to take stock of your passions, employ what I would call the all roads lead to Rome theory, that everything we do and the experience we have right now all add to our creative selves. Last week I spoke about networking and how I believe it's the perfect time to take a step back and research people you'd love to work with. 
Justin's advice this week about knowing the market and having a strong sense of yourself as an artist being equally as important in your career really resonated with me. We are not Campbell Soup. We are not for everyone. I feel like making a (laughs) t-shirt. So let's talk about how we could make the most of our opportunities when we're in front of people networking. Let's talk about how we develop that artist sense of self. When the opportunity arises to network in a meaningful way, or you end up being the person that needs to justify why the wall is blue, as Justin said, you have a developed sense of yourself as an artist. So let's define our artist mission statement. Grab a pen and a piece of paper. I'm going to give you a lot of questions to consider. Make a list of your core values. Keep it positive. Keep it present. Keep it active. Why do you do what you do? Who and what are your influences? How do you feel your work is unique? What stories are you inspired to tell? What aspects of yourself do you feel are important to bring to the stories you're telling? What are your sources and your inspiration for the work? Who is the audience and how do you want to engage with that audience? And how do you want to grow as an artist? Think of the people that inspire you. I bet that every one of them is mission-driven and you understand why they tell the stories they tell. They have a clear artistic voice and that's part of their appeal. If you need some help figuring out who you are as an artist, what makes you tick, what interests you, what you want to dig into, I recommend you head over to the Backstage YouTube channel. We have a lot of great content over there. I'm going to highlight one um episode for you to consider listening or watching. It's Brett Sufford. He's a life coach and successful actor. He's a great episode called How to Structure Your Time in a Time of Crisis. I love that Justin brought up the fact that new and emerging artists use our site for their casting calls. We have a lot of indie and student films that are up on the site. There's often casting calls for for workshops of all types, film, TV, theatre, And although there may not be a huge financial compensation to the project, it is a great way to build your reel, build your network as an artist, and get some really substantial experience. To my casting calls, building on that, there's an NYU student project I thought I would highlight. It's an audio recording project named Stories from the Front Lines, an audio drama. Some NYU alumni include Oliver Stone, Rachel Morrison, Nia DaCosta, Joel Cohen, just to name a few. So when you're working with some of these top schools, you're working with the voices of tomorrow. Another casting call I wanted to highlight, financial social video. It's a casting call looking for 30-somethings for an online social TikTok-style video for a financial service company. One day shoot in NYC, $500 for the day. I sometimes I highlight in the UK, we've got really great casting calls in Australia. Um, we have great regional calls as well as, of course, big hubs of, of New York, Chicago, LA. And of course, Atlanta, Georgia is another huge acting hub, uh, home of Tyler Perry's film studio, etc. cetera. Uh, so let's talk about Atlanta, Georgia. I have an example of one of our casting calls from that area. It's a vector explainer video seeking a gamer in in quotation marks, to explain some of the features of a product named Vector. Um, It's an in-person shoot in the Atlanta area. Check that out on the site. It's a short one this week, but pretty dense. I feel inspired by Justin to go back and look at my artist mission statement. I hope I've inspired you and Justin has inspired you to do the same. We should know the market and we should know ourselves as artists. That's all from me for this time. Have a beautiful, beautiful week. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, 
and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.